church in different visions. We visualize the church. And the reason that uh, Paul and Jesus used, we call, Paul calls them parables, or they're called parables. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so that's what a parable is. And so we've looked at the church, visualizing the church as a body. And why do we see the church as a body? Because God has placed every one of us in the body as it has pleased Him. Amen. And Amen. so that means that we're all in need of one another. The hand can't say, I don't need you. Or the eyes can't say to the feet, I don't need you. The whole body has come together to need each other. And that's the reason we see the church as the body of Christ. Amen. Now Christ is ahead. So we're going to see we Christ in each one of these as we begin to picture them as the body of Christ. And then we went and pictured visualizing the church as a building. Now, why, what, what's the story we get out of this, uh, this visualizing the church as a building? We're all working together, and the presence of the Lord dwells in each one of us. Amen. Remember, he dwelt in the old tabernacle, he dwelt in Solomon's temple, and now his whole aim was to dwell inside you and I. Amen. And we are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Put us all together, we become a building. And so the presence of God uh, is, to, is dwelling inside of each one of us. And then we picture the church, or visualize the church, as a bride the theme of the church as a bride. You can no one's <laughs> we bride is Jesus and he's away. John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. Jesus said, I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna prepare a place for you. But when I come again, I'm gonna so the bride purifies herself because she sets herself aside and does not serve idols into the world. And you're not like some of the children of Israel that kept yearning to go back into Egypt. And we're not to, we don't do that. But we purify ourselves as we see Jesus coming. As we're looking for his coming, we purify ourselves. We keep ourselves clean. So that's the reason when he showed us the picture of the bride. What about the sheep? The sheep, we can't lead ourselves. We are completely lost if we're left to ourselves. Amen. And so we see the sheep needing the shepherd and the shepherd taking care of the sheep and looking over the sheep. And um, I have taught one time whenever uh, the sheep, you know, sometimes we look at sheep and we think uh, someone's way out here and some's right by us. But I saw a picture one time where the sheep was around his feet and there was some scattered all out here. And I thought, that's a funny picture. And on the bottom it had written, those that stay close to him get all the goodies. <laughs> those that wander right away, they're not right close to him to get all the goodies and all the things. So we stay close to the shepherd because he leads us. He doesn't hurt us. He leads us. And so he is the great shepherd. Uh, we pictured last week the church being a soldier. And what does a soldier do? A soldier gets prepared for battle. And we're in a battle, whether we like it or not. The day that you said, Jesus, come into my heart, that was the day that Satan took up. He'd been just laying aside and doing nothing, probably, because he had you by the nose and he was just, you were just being controlled by him and didn't even know it. But when you begin to serve God as a soldier, God gives us armor to put on so that we, and what's that armor? Jesus. He's our armor. He's our helmet of salvation. He's our uh, uh, shield of, uh, our breastplate of righteousness. We have no righteousness. He's our uh, girdle of truth. He's our sword of the spirit. And I left that off. That's that. But I want you to just write it in there. He's the sword of the spirit. And he's the shield of faith. He's every one of those. And as we get dressed, we dress up in Jesus. So we see the soldiers prepare themselves, and we have the commander, and he is on us. When God Father looks at me, he doesn't see what I used to be, but he sees Jesus. <laughs> I'm dressed in Jesus. And so tonight, we're going to go into...
uh, if you go to your notes, we're going to visualize the church as a kingdom of priests. Now I know this is a little shocking, but as I began to uh, study this a uh, few days or weeks ago, as I began to study this, uh, the Holy Spirit really impressed on me that we don't see this picture of, of us very often, and we don't—I mean, we don't visualize it. But we are a kingdom of priests. Amen. Now, if you look at your little picture that I went and put on the uh, front, I gave you a little visual. You'll see that the priest has a garment. And it's in Exodus, the 28th chapter. And it names all the parts. And I know I probably, um, anyway, there was the names of all the things that the priests were to wear. God gave the, the pattern. And he told Moses, tell Aaron, which was representing the high priest, and his sons would be the, uh, <laughs> the priest. And, so, and then we see that the armor that we have on, so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to visualize the Old Testament and the New Testament priests. We are priests. So let's go into our study here, and let's look at, I wrote a lot of scriptures out, that's the reason this looks like it's so long. So as we're visualizing the church as a kingdom of priests, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9 says this, and verse 2, You also, as lively stones, remember we said very stone, build up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what's the priest's... Uh, of it, what's, what are their main reason he pictures us as a priest? Is we offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Father. Is that what the Old Testament priests did? Yes. They ministered from the people to, the, uh, to, the, to God. And they were busy about ministry all the time. From the people to, the, to, the, uh, to God. And as you begin to read in Exodus and, and see how what, all these things that they did. And so we'll see that in the body of Christ, we are to do the very same. And so he says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. We are... A royal, we are a holy priesthood. We are a royal priesthood. A holy priesthood. That means we're set apart from the world. When the world looks at us, we should be different. Amen. Not a lot. We should be different a lot in our dress, too. But we should be modest. But we should be honest. We should be uh, always willing to go the second mile. We should always be willing to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We Amen. should always be exalting them. We should always be loving on them. We should be doing this. This is a, a holy priesthood and a, a royal priesthood. Royal, we are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is our King and we serve Him and we are the priesthood of Christ. Look in Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. And I didn't write down verses 3 and 4 and 5, so I want you to go into Exodus. And, it, and Genesis, Exodus um, 19. And let's look at verses 3 to 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. He brought you. He was, they were bringing him to himself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my commandments, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me. Above all people, for, for all the earth is mine. And this is the sixth one, the one I want to say. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Don't we see that re, uh, uh, repeated over here in uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9? A holy nation, a peculiar people. 
People that show forth the praises of our God. We're not ashamed of calling our God. We will stand up for Him. We would be willing to lay down our life for our King, King and Lord instead of compromise with the world or compromise with anyone. We should be we love our God with all our heart, soul, and our mind. Let's look in Isaiah 51, 6. Isaiah said here, But you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall you boast yourselves. We shall be named the priests of the Lord. Amen. Now many times we Amen. think that priest is only the pastor and those in leaders. No, we're all priests. We're all ministers. We're all doing the work of the ministry. Amen. Amen. But God has set some in the church. And the priesthood. He said some as pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, workers of the miracles. We see the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. Every one of us here tonight has a ministry. And we don't know what it is. We need to find out what it is and get busy uh, working. Because I really believe, and this is just my belief, I really believe if we're doing things that we're not supposed to be doing, God doesn't even see them, take an account of them. But we're just playing. We're, we're just trying to be something we're not. In other words, it's like me trying to be a pilot of an airplane plane when I don't have any education or I don't have know how to fly a plane. But I want to fly a plane. So I get on the plane and I take off. How many of you would ride with me? I don't think one of you would. Oh, Mike said he would. <laughs> Boy, Mike, you got more faith in me than I got in myself. <laughs> so in other words, God places us into the body of Christ and we are priests and uh, so in other words calling on my life the other day as I was getting a little sick and I said uh, I would tell my husband I said yeah, I'm feeling a little bit and he said okay let's pray so he comes over and he said Barbara receive the gift of healing I said okay I do in Jesus name you know that, at the end of that day I was still like running through a troop and leaning <laughs> over a log <laughs> because we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. My husband doesn't. You know, it's we've got the gift, the Holy Spirit. And the gifter, the gift, gives gifts. And so, you know what? We can even pray. That's how the world will know that we are Christians. If we, someone says, I am just, I've really been feeling sick. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, minister the gift of healing to this one. Healing, minister the gift of healings to this one. It's his gifts, and he wants to give them to whoever will accept him, whoever will come to him. But he's looking for the priesthood to stand up and be that his hand extended, to be his mouth ex uh, ex ex telling about the good things of God. Then he says uh, we need to spend personal time with our Father. With all prayer. Now what is all prayer? Well, I don't know. As I was looking, I thought, Holy Spirit... Now, what is all prayer? And as I begin to look in the Word, I really felt like there's only two all prayers. Praying in the Spirit and praying in the understanding. When he told the church to go forth, he said, I command you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and go forth. And the power of the Holy Spirit will do the work. You will be the vessels. You will be the channel. My Holy Spirit is going to give you the power. He's going to do the work. So I wrote down, with all prayer means Holy Spirit praying and understanding praying. And if we only understand praying, pray with our understanding, we are very, very shallow. Amen. When I only do understanding praying, I'm shallow. Because you know what? I only know the surface, the little skin at the top. When, when a prayer request comes over the phone and I look at it and it says, well, if it says salvation, I know that they need salvation and I begin to pray for salvation. But if it just says pray for, uh, when we pray for each other, you know, I don't know your life, but you know the Holy Spirit does. And as I begin to lift your name before the Father, the Holy Spirit takes over and prays for you. We become the channel He flows through. And He is praying according to the will of the Father. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what it takes to get that. And so many times, we, we don't give the Holy Spirit a time enough to work on doing things that He wants to do in people's lives. 
So we see praying, uh, the Holy Spirit praying. We see understanding praying. And underneath these two comes this. Praise, worship, thanksgiving, confession, intercession, petition, warfare. And I thought, oh yeah, Lord, I've done this before. Travail. I don't know if you knew you ever travailed in the spirit. Well, you women will understand this has had a baby. When you travail in the spirit, it's birthing forth whatever God has laid on your heart. And you may not even know what, but travail comes on you. And there's a groaning inside of you that can't be contained. Amen. Oh, yes, I can stop it anytime I want. But you don't want to because that travailing is, is coming forth. Amen. People don't know how to travail anymore in the spirit. Oh, I tell you, I love to travail in the spirit. I love for the Holy Spirit to just begin to use me in travailing for lost souls or something that's happening in that, in that he wants to take a hold of. And then, the last but not least, and I'm sure there's probably more of these, and you could probably list them, but listening. You know, many times we don't train ourselves just to listen for God. Listen for him. Listen to him. Sometimes I get up in the morning, and I just, I'm thrilled to just go, and listen to him. And you know, he begins to speak to my mind. And he begins to speak in my spirit. And he begins to tell me secrets, things. And you know one thing that the Lord wants us is not to brag about what he says to us. I learned that this, the hard way. He says, okay, Barbara, keep this to yourself. It's just between me and you. It's not for anyone else, but just you and me. Amen. It's almost like, a relationship that a husband and a wife have, that intimate relationship. It's almost like that. You don't go around broadcasting it, but it's just between you and him, that intimate relationship that you have together. And then he says, supplication, I begin to uh, bring out some of these. Supplication in the spirit, where it says here, and praying always with all prayer, and supplication in the spirit, our secret weapon is the Holy Spirit. Our secret weapon is the Word. Our secret weapon is Jesus. And there's three that bear record. There are three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these bear record together. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I know we've probably been here, so I might not even uh, stay on this very long. I know I've taught it before, but uh, 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And look at verse 2. And I like what Brother Gary said about the other day. If we don't have love, none of this mounts the hill of beans. It really isn't. All it is is just make-believe. All it is is just putting on a show. So we find out that love is the one that all of these things work from. Love. So in verse uh, 14, uh, verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to man, but to God. For no man understands him. And many times we don't even understand it. Howbeit, however, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. He speaks divine secrets. Amen. Secrets, divine secrets is what this word mystery means. And then look at verse 14, the same chapter, 14. For if I pray in an under, unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Let me tell you, whenever I begin to walk in praying in the Holy Spirit every day of my life, as I begin to do that, oh yes, at first, the thought would come into my mind. Now, Barbara, now come on, you're being a little silly. Now, this is, yeah, you know, Satan wants to attack us. He wants to make us think. But this is gibberish. It's no, it's not. But let me tell you, the more you begin to yield to the Holy Spirit, you sense the presence of the Holy Spirit on your life. And you sense where he wants you to go and what he wants you to say and what he wants you to do. And then look in verse 15. What is it then Paul said? I will pray with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. And then Paul says in the 18th verse, I think, my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. But you know what? Our prayer, our, the, the priesthood in the holy language, 
is when we are by ourselves in our closets. Amen. That's where we're to use uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us. In our closets. Oh, only when we're in the congregation are we to, not to be in confusion. And Paul is talking about uh, in, the, in the congregation and at home. At home, he prayed more in the spirit than he said all of you do. And the mistake the Corinthians were making is they were praying in the, uh, they would get up and start speaking. I could start praying in tongues right now, but it wouldn't do you any good. It would edify me and build me up, but it wouldn't do you any good unless it was for you, an interpretation, unless there was an interpretation in the, in the building. And so when we pray in tongues in the church, sometimes it's just a burst of praise. I find myself doing that. Just a burst of praise in the Spirit of God. So anyway, let's look at, it says, supplication means to ask for humble, to be for humble humility and earnest. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. Paul said, or Timothy, Paul told Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And I'm going to do a little reprimand here, and uh, I really feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to realize I know I don't care for the way the president and all of them are going. But you know, the Bible tells us to pray for him. Amen. To lift him up. To lift his wife up. Begin to pray for them. And that's what we're commissioned to do. Not to criticize and condemn. Yes, we all know that maybe I, to me, you know. But my job is to hold up those in authority over us. Those that are ruling the country. Because you know what? Uh, it's in uh, Romans, the 13th chapter. The, the policemen, uh, the governors, everyone's been set in because that's how God keeps us keeps the world under control. You know, the policemen, they may not be Christian, but they're doing the work to keep uh, thieves and ro robbers and murderers and all those off of there. So we even need to be praying for our police department. We need to be praying for those that are over, the mayor, the one different ones. We need to find out their names, and we need to pray for them as the Holy Spirit lays it upon our hearts. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I'll just insert it here. I really feel like God wants us to put a prayer book together. Now you go, oh, oh no, no, no. It's for discipline. And so as we began to, like maybe Monday, well, you, I pray the way the Holy Spirit wants me to pray. But I do set aside certain days for certain things that I make sure I want to pray for. And so that's what the Holy Spirit, I really feel like he's leading us to do. Look in Hebrews again. Hebrews 5. And verses 5 to 10. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said to him, you are my son, today have I begotten you. As he says in, in, also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crimes and tears, to him that was able to save him from the death and was hurt and that he feared. Though he was a son, that's talking about Jesus, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all that obey him. And uh, it's over on 10 also. Call to God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You and I are called high priest. I mean, uh, a kingdom of priests. After the order of our, our brother, Jesus Christ. He paved the way. You and I are busy about the Father's business. Um, 1 Peter 3.12. Did you have 1 Peter 3.12? Oh, he does. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their request, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So God, he is, what do you think? 
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. He's all, his ears are open. You can bake your life on it. His ears are open to our prayers. Amen. Then I'm going to go down. I'm going to, I put down uh, Romans 8, 26 and 29. I've got to read that. That is without that. Wow. <laughs> Romans 8, 26 and 20. Uh, 26, 27, and 28. Now I know sometimes what we do is we quote this one scripture by itself. And, and I know I've heard people say this, and I've said it too. So, uh, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. How do we know that all things are working together for good? How am I sure of that? Go to verse 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities, our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray as we ought. We don't know how to pray. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now I'm assured that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When I begin to pray for things, I know that all things are going to work for good and for the good. I can have that assurance. Because why? The Holy Spirit is doing the praying. He is using me as a channel. And I know whatever I'm praying about is going to be working out for my best, Amen. for your best. Who's ever that I'm praying for? The phrase in the Spirit means praying under the Holy Spirit's influence and with His aid. The Holy Spirit takes up His end of prayer when we pray. He is interpreting our deepest needs to God and making requests in harmony with the Father's will. Oh, I tell you, that just blesses me. I mean, when I know I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm praying according to God's will. And I know that all things work together for good to them of the Lord. Then that verse, that same verse in Ephesians, watching thereunto with all perseverance. Perseverance means being persistent, being steadfast, being watchful to the end. And with the, uh, I can't remember where it's at. It's in the Galatians, I think. Be not weary in well-doing. You shall reap in due season if you faint not. Amen. Oh, Abraham waited 25 years before he got his son. But you know what? Sometimes we only wait overnight or a week and we go, well, I guess it's not going to happen. No, 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 no. No. We need to be persistent. We need. And you know, I was listening to a minister one time and I loved this thought so much I wrote it down in my, uh, my Bible. God, you said. <laughs> God, you said. All things work together if I'm praying to the Spirit. You said it, Father, and I can stand upon that because he said it. And I tell you, it's wonderful. Be watchful to the end. He will prompt us to pray. He will also guide our prayers and take us into God's presence before the throne of grace. Number five, and supplication for all saints. Let's get the names of all the members of this body and other Christians that we, we know. Let's get their names. And let's keep, uh, uh, where am I at here? Uh, the attendance body of believers and other believers we know and pray for them, making a prayer book if it helps us jog our memory. Now some of you, I know you probably don't need a book to jog your memory. You probably just remember it, but I don't. <laughs> uh, when Brother, um, I call him Saint now because Saint, this, yes. uh, Brother Saint, when he sent me those texts, I can't remember all of those. But you know, Prayer chain. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Unsaved loved ones. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, yeah, Lord. There may be someone called to the prayer chain. Unsaved love. Uh, they've got an unsaved person they're praying for. And so the book is just a guideline. It's not that, oh, well, i got to have my book for a pray. No, no, no. What God wants us to do is put us in remembrance of the things that we need to pray for. Oh, and we're going to learn different types of prayer. We're going to learn, and from the Bible, not from me, but from the Bible. Then it says, uh, and I put hindrances in prayer. I think it's time for me to close. Hindrances in prayers. Satan fears the power of prayer more than anything else. 
to Satan, prayer is lethal. And his weapon for the Christians is to keep them, keep and hinder us from our prayer life. The flesh will be our greatest battle. Our flesh will be our greatest battle. When I begin to learn to pray and see God's face, I think I've said this before, but I'll share it again in case someone didn't hear it. I, got, I always had disciplined myself to get up very early in the morning because I had to be at work at 5 and 6. And so I had and the mornings was my quiet time. I didn't have the kids wanting this and Lloyd wanting this. And I had eight babies that lived with me for five years at once. So I began to discipline myself. And I, I, I used to be asleep. I'll tell you what, I could sleep in. Lloyd had to make me get up and fix breakfast when we were younger. He'd say, hey, i got to go to the meal and work now. you got to get up and fix my breakfast. And because it was so wonderful not to be able to work because I was the oldest of nine kids. And all my life, I had gone out and take care of kids. And so when I got married, I thought, oh, I, I, this is wonderful. But no, I found out it wasn't so wonderful after a while. But I wanted, to, I wanted to get up and pray early. So in my bathroom, I would set an alarm clock so I couldn't reach over and turn it off. And when it went off, first thing I did, because I didn't want to wake Lloyd up, because he had to go to work at a certain time. So I jumped into the bathroom, closed the door, and turned it and began to splash water on my face. And as I began to do that, I began to discipline myself. And you know, now I just wake up automatically. I don't even have to have anything done to me. Because I, as we begin to train the flesh, the flesh is not will. And so that's going to be our first battle, is overcoming the flesh. Putting down whatever is taking first place in our life and putting Christ first. Amen. Come on, you kingdom of priests. We're going to have to act like priests. We're going to have to begin to fulfill the calling that God has placed upon our lives. Amen. So, number one, I put laziness. Many Christians are simply lazy because it, when it comes to prayer. We confess that we believe in prayer, but when it comes to action, acting on it, we let our... our we let other things take its place. Another thing that will hinder us, and I didn't elaborate on because I was running out of, uh, and I didn't want to do another page on the typewriter. So I, unforgiving spirit, that is a hindrance to us when we pray. Amen. Sin in our own lives, not confessing our sins, and not wanting to give them up. Remember Pastor Todd, I don't know, very long ago, lay in Ephesians, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Hebrews, the, uh, 13th chapter, lay the weight that aside, the weights and the sin that so easily beset us. Lay them aside. Amen. Get rid of them. We have the power to do that. Sin in our lives, unbelief, we need to get rid of that. Idols in our lives, there are, these are only a few hindrances, and Satan keeps us, uses them to keep us from prayer. Amen. He uses them to keep us from prayer. So, Kingdom of priests, are we going to be priests for the Lord? Are we going to hold up what God has called us to be? A kingdom of priests. We're going to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yes, Father, yes. As we bow our heads, I don't want you lifting your hands and, and telling me anything. I don't want to know it. But I want you to just, right now, if there's things that are... You know, you just say, God, start working on me. Start working on me, Father. Father, you see me, Lord. Start working on me, Father. Open my ears to hear what you want to say to me. Open my ears, Lord. Open these people's ears, Lord, that we will begin to show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness. Not just on Sunday morning. Not just on Sunday night or Tuesday night. But, oh, God, every day as we walk before you, every day is you're, you're the only thing that we want in this whole life. Nothing else is worth it. Father, you see the people's hearts. And so, Father, I pray that you will answer these, these uh, desires that's in their heart as, you be, as they begin to take little steps towards it. Oh, Father, we don't become Isaiah's overnight. But, Lord, as we begin to walk in that, Lord, you'll begin to add a little more to us and a little more to us. You don't expect us, Lord, to just all of a sudden be a changed person in these habits or things that's in our life. But, Lord, may we begin to learn to be the pre kingdom priests that you have called us to be. 
Amen. Now, before we dismiss, next week, I feel like the Lord has laid this. We're going to study the life of Jesus. Oh, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go into some prayers in that, and I'm not going to take like I did tonight. I put, uh, it's strange that people feel little need to pray. Jesus prayed often. He left us an example. Why did Jesus pray? He knew everything. No. He didn't. He had to hear the Father to know. Amen. He sought the Father's face. He laid aside his deity. And he, only, he said, I only say and do what I hear my Father say and do. Amen. And he had to spend time with him or to know that, didn't he? Enjoy spending time with his father. He, did he enjoy spending time with his father? Yes, I enjoy spending time. He, to know his father's will, guidance, and support, he showed his dependency.